I'm just going to give it one more minute then we'll get going with today's session. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to, um, well, it's the beginning of Falls Awareness Week this week um, and going from uh, Monday to Friday. We've got a couple of webinars on and this is our first one, um, Monday uh, morning, um, where we're going to be talking about monitoring falls and in particular severity of falls and what that means and what you can do um, as providers to ensure we're um promoting people to have the best health outcomes even if it means that they they are falling um so for those of you who don't know me um i've had a little look at the list i know many of you um i'm verity i work for hcpa and i manage the prevention and enablement team where we have a focus uh we definitely have a focus on falls but actually as we all know falls is so much bigger than just falls prevention. Um, it's about falls management. Also, what uh, looking at somebody holistically and ensuring that people um, are living the best quality of life. So I hope hopefully that you you agree with that. Um, so we're going for an hour this morning. Um, 11 till 12 you have some of you have already started using the chat box, which is lovely. Um, it's nice to say nice to see uh uh, you will say good morning. I can't see you. So it's nice to know that you're there. Um, and please continue to use that as we go through. So any questions, I'll try and keep an eye on it. Um, and if not, I'll get, I'll get to questions at the end. Um, you will get the slides, you will get the recording, um, and you will get some certificates as well for attending um, this morning. Um, you do not have access to your videos or your mic, so I can't hear you. So if there is anything you do want to know, um, please use that chat box. Um, and you'll also have my details as well. So I'll make sure you can you can always drop me a line after. OK, so um, today's objectives, what we're going to be going through um, uh, this morning is why we're doing today's webinar. Why am I focusing on monitoring falls and in particular the in particular the severity of falls and what that means? Um, what that links in with is understanding or, or being aware of falls risk factors. So if we're considering all the right risk factors, then we should be also considering specific interventions and triangulation across care plans to ensure that um you are evidencing what you're doing to prevent falls, but not only falls, because we know people will fall, but also how to reduce that severity because no one wants those severe injuries, do, do we? We don't want the hospital admissions. Of course, we know that sometimes accidents happen and absolutely, um, but then what we want to show is how we're being proactive in that, as in to prevent that happening um, again. Um, and then I'm going to go through ways that um, I would like to see this all being evidenced and how you can use our framework to help you do that. Now, some of you who have worked with us before will have frameworks in place or aware of it. Um, and if not, then it's it's another tool for you to, to add to your box and to say, this is all the good stuff that we are doing. Because quite often there is lots of great things happening, but the evidence isn't there. And, and I want you to shout about the good stuff um, because, you know, quite often the culture with falls is fingers pointing and saying, well, how, why have you got so many falls? And that shouldn't be the case. It should be really trying to understand them and actually showing what you're doing to prevent and to manage that, that severity. So I hope that all makes sense. Um, and a little bit about the service, if you're not sure about what we do um, and how we can support you. Um, as I said, we, we know falls are going to happen. Um, 
individuals are living with such complex health conditions, um, which do put the risk of them off falling. Um, we know in particular, you know, Parkinson's, um, a, a dementia, and people who've had um, a stroke or arthritis, um, we can't take those things away from people. So it's best how, how we're supporting them. So ultimately, our aim is, is never to get falls down to zero, because <laughs> you all know that that's not possible. I also want to ensure that people are moving um, and that they are living a good quality of life. Um, so with that comes ensuring that you are evidence in how you are encouraging better health outcomes for individuals um, and reducing the, you know, that severity. So what my job is, is to ensure that we have a culture of prevention and enablement. Prevention's huge, isn't it? You know, prevention of all sorts, not just falls, but ill health, hospital admissions, um, you know, um, poor mental health as well, as well as physical health. So what we want to be doing is seeing those positive outcomes and getting people moving more, sitting less, improving quality of life while looking at where we can improve. Um, of course, if we can reduce falls, then great. Um, but, you know, there's so much more to that. And it's how we want to evidence those, those outcomes. So a question, I'm going to get you using the chat box straight away, because um, I know what these webinars are like, death by PowerPoint sometimes. Um, what are the type of outcomes you want to see from the people that are, um, you know, using your service, from the people that you support? What do you want to see? So if you can use your chat box. Morning to those that are still coming in. Lovely. Thank you. Um, so confidence rebuilt. Yes, that's a huge one, isn't it? Confidence, because we know that um, if somebody does have a bad injury, then actually that can knock them forever. And that's it. And that can be in their that can mean that they they may not come out of their rooms again or they may not want to move again. Um, so what else do we have? Uh, less hospital admissions, absolutely that's huge, isn't it? We want that. We don't want people waiting 12, 13, 14 hours for an ambulance and then spending days in hospital. Um, ensuring safety, yes, absolutely. Um, independence, yes, good. Um, we really want to improve people's independence and that comes into what prevention is as well. Um, so how can they continue to live in their home safely? Good. Linking in with independence as well. Um, we've got less anxiety after falls. Yes, very much linking in with fear and confidence and anxiety and what comes with that. And quite often, I'm probably going to be skipping to Thursday with a lot of this as well, because I've got another webinar on Thursday where we're going to talk about some real risk factors and interventions in more detail where we're going to look at fear and what we can do about it, because quite often we don't acknowledge it in falls risk assessments. Um, we've got, uh, yes, severity of fall. That's good. You're in the right place. Um, keeping people on their feet as strong as possible, reduce the risk of serious injury through enabling strength and muscles. Yeah, perfect. You can take my webinar, Becky, because that's spot on. Good stuff. Um, better quality of life. Good. And when we think about quality of life, it's an it's a it's a word or a phrase that we use quite a lot isn't it and it can be quite throwaway but actually what that, when we really dig deep d deep into that it's about the independence it's about the less it's about the severity it's about the anxiety side of things so really understanding what what we mean by quality of life um serious injuries yes independence um falls reoccurrence that's a great one um, absolutely, because we know the more people are falling, of course, they're, they're higher risk. Um, confidence, good. Pressure sores, absolutely. Um, awareness to staff in regards to risk of falls. Yes, we need to make sure that the education is there. Um, so absolutely. And I'll, I'll touch on that at the end. So lovely. Um, perfect answers from everyone. Um Outcomes is that, let's go back to my screen, um, outcomes are, def are defined as the impact or end results of, 
um, services on a person's life. So what we want to do is support people to live the best life possible, build on their own strengths and capabilities. And as some of you have already said around the confidence and the independence and the enabling is enable people um, to learn or regain skills or independence they may have lost. Now, people can improve, can't they? Um, I hope I can't hear you, but I hope you're all saying yes. Um, people can improve. So we want to really evidence that how how we're trying to do that, because that comes into falls. Absolutely. Um, and of course, linking to connected lives as well in Hertfordshire, um, Hertfordshire's, you know, strength based approach to ensure that people are um living the best life possible through prevention through enabling through connection and support um to ensure that people have those better outcomes um now if you need more information about connected lives i believe there is a webinar coming up um either this week or next week i can't remember when um so please make sure you have a um have a look if you're aware of it but maybe not sure what the next steps are looking like in hertfordshire so um please make sure you have a look at our um page on our on our website and also linking i promise you i'm not i'm talking rubbish but we're also linking to the cqc we statements as well so when we think about effective a lot of this a lot of these statements are exactly what we want to be talking about when we're looking at prevention when we're looking at falls when we're looking at people's quality of life so I won't read everyone out um, and as I said you'll get the slides um but ensuring that we're looking at overall of course health care well-being and communication needs with them and that comes into falls as well we should be involving people um it and including their wishes, their likes, their dislikes, their goals, their aspirations um, as part of falls prevention too. Um, and I'm going to touch on that a little bit later on. Um, to ensure that, you know, we are understanding what's important and, and matters to the person. And we are also promoting current evidence based good practice and standards. So and uh, today and Thursday's webinar are, are looking at the evidence based. Um, so, I promise I'm not making it up. Um, it's all there, um, and we've we've got to make sure we're um, evidencing it all in the right way. Working together across teams, as we know, it is everybody's responsibility. So, through multidisciplinary teams, um, as somebody said, awareness to staff's education is uh, for falls education is huge, um, and uh, that can also support, you know, that information when people move from different services. I think this sums everything up perfectly. Health and well-being, so they can maximise independence, choice and, and control. So we want people to live their, you know, healthier lives um, as possible. Um, we want to improve people, um, so ensure that outcomes are positive, as we've all said. Um, and lastly, consent to care and treatment. Um, so we are, you know, respecting those when we deliver person centred care. Um, and we know person centred care revolutionised care. Right. So did the Mental Capacity Act pers uh, and um, the Care Act. But now it's about how we go one step fur further and have the skills to really enable people. OK, so um, first things first, management of a fall. Some of you I know will be aware of, you know, you'll be aware of this from any of the previous work we've done together or, um, you know, through your, your policies and procedures. But um, management of a fall. So when a fall has occurred, um, we have specifically, we have a care home pathway for falls, uh, management of a fall in a, in a care home. There is work being done in the com for the community one, um, so it's not completed yet, but there is work being done on it. But it's the same for everybody. Um, we firstly assess, of course, the red and amber flags, um, you know, that initial first aid um, to, let, to tell us whether we need to call 999 first, 111, or a prevention of admission service. Once that's all, once all the initial checks have been done, and as I said, I'm not going to be going through this in huge detail uh, today, 
um, we then complete the post falls assessment tool. Now, this is where once we've done all of our checks, we've let the right people know, and that decision is a, is either from clinical advice or that person is, is able to get up from the floor, we then um, include, try and start to build that picture of what happened um, with that fall. And that will include the severity form as well, which I will come to. We then inform the right people, relatives, carers, um, and document the discussion um, in the care plan. If necessary, we commence that falls investigation. Uh, we update our risk assessments and we document interventions within a falls care plan and we make sure that's up, up to date every time. Um, so hopefully that fits in with your, your policies and procedures with our first initial checks of what we do. And once that decision has been made, we're able to then look at the post falls assessment. And what that means is, um, as I said, to document the assessment once the primary and the secondary survey has been taken place. So we know that as our red flags. And if somebody has any of those red flags, it will go straight to 999. Or if it's an amber flag, maybe we'll go and get some clinical advice. Um, we then want to ensure the use of actually taking basic health observation so we can monitor that individual, because as we know, People can change and deteriorate over time, especially after a fall. Um, and that um, I've got news two and restore two on there. Now, if you're not aware of those tools, it's about how we are escalating um, people who have deteriorated quickly. So the news is about the soft signs of deterioration. And then the restore is around uh, how we escalate that correctly. Um, now we do it a news and restore is in some of our training so we do teach um, staff how to use it and we can always support your service in the ha the manager handbook um, and how to embed the um, the right processes around basic health observations we then look at the level of consciousness pain or discomfort if there's any injury or wounds movement and mobility and we look at starting to dig a little deeper about the cause of the fall. Um, and then the outcome of the fall to document the correct inv investigations. That leads us to the severity incident report form, body map, and also 24 hours after that fall has happened. So I'm going to share my screen to what this looks like and I'll make sure this gets out to you all. OK, hopefully everybody can see that. Let me know if you can't. Um, I'm going to zoom in a little bit. OK, so this might look like something you have on your electronic um, devices um, if you've got electronic care planning. So we've got the name of the individual, uh, place of residence, location of full, date and time. Um, then we've got a tick in sign box on, on the level of consciousness, pain or discomfort, any more information around the pain, um, injury or wounds, um, and where they are, and then movement and mobility. And then we've also got the, the news and restore down there. And then cause of the fall, as we know, looking at all the internal and the external factors. So the internal is about the individual themselves, and the external is about the environment, so what's around them. We know there are many, many, many risk factors that can come into those boxes. Um, then we've got the outcome of the fall. Um, so who's been in, who's been informed? What investigations need to take place? And then here we get to the severity of full grading scale. Now, some of you may on your electronic care systems have similar, but then language might be a little bit different, which we're aware of. So, you know, I'm not going to tell you to reinvent the wheel, but just making sure that you're using those systems and you're, you're aware it might look like low injury, major injury, severe injury, um, et cetera. Um, so you can have no harm um, at the top and whether it was witnessed or unwitnessed. Um, low harm, again, witnessed or unwitnessed, moderate, severe, 
Um, and then lastly, um, death. So actually recording those severity of falls, not just recording that it's gone to a 999 or that person's had to go to hospital, actually, you know, what harm did, did what harm um, occurred. We then got body map as well. So assessment of injury, which will look, I'm sure, similar to what you already have in place. Um, and then we've got lastly our 24 hour post falls observation log. So always we want to monitor individuals 24 hours following a fall and um, following advice from a clinician. If they have been consulted, we always do that first and foremost. Um, and then first observation should be as soon as possible after the fall. And then every 15 minutes, half an hour, one, uh, two hours and then every four hours. But again, uh, it will depend on the, the advice from a clinician if you have got one. Now, I saw a comment come up around during day opportunities. Um, so some of this will be relevant to you. Some of it won't be because you may not be doing all you, you know, that person. You're not there to do all the observations, but you can absolutely use the recording of a fall if that has happened um, at your service um, as well as the severity. So you can use that. So that's the form, um, but what we're really gonna be talking about today is around that severity and why that should be documented within um, your um, assessments, why we should also be looking at how we reduce severity of falls. Um, and that's gonna be around the evidence-based information, which I'm gonna go through. Um, so where did the full severity form come from originally? So it actually does get referenced in the NICE guidance um, for falls, assessment and prevention of falls in, in older people. Um, as we know, the level of harm is indicated by the classification code. And then we can look at if it was unwitnessed or, or not witnessed, which hopefully should be documented anyway. So here we go again, just um, I just had a I just did some screenshots of it. So we've got no harm low harm and some guidance that goes along with it as well as you might say well how do i know if it's moderate or severe but hopefully that makes it quite clear for you so why 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 did i choose to do this webinar for you all uh, this morning um because we have to understand the type of falls happening at your service we know that you you know you will hopefully document how many falls are happening but that number doesn't tell us very much does it and that number we have to think well let's dig deeper and understand what's been happening so we know the falls are going to happen and um, so understanding the severity of the form can uh, can support your accurate reporting documentation um i want to know if we were having a conversation right how many falls have resulted in injury um how severe injury or how many minor injury, um, how many have resulted in going into hospital and what was the reasons for that? So it can show the complexity of falls occurring at your service. We know you may have really complex individuals and they, are, they may continue to fall. Um, so reporting on the severity gives providers an opportunity to evidence how you are also promoting better health outcomes to reduce risk of high severity injuries. So if you say to me, Verity, I've got this number of falls at my service, but actually, let me tell you, I've had very low severe injuries, very low hospital admissions. And I wanna say, right, what are you doing then? And where is that documented? So we actually want to evidence on how you are preventing further deterioration and those admissions. So it comes down probably to not it's probably not your favorite word <laughs> um as um you know with all the other work that you have to do but it does come down to that right evidence so firstly yes we want to monitor the severity of falls we want to monitor the hospital admissions 999 calls if there is a severe injury not only documenting that that is severe let's look at when they return home do your staff have the right skills? Do they have the right knowledge to enable that pe person to improve? Have you evidence further prevention? 
So quite often you will all tell me great stories, how you've got people back up on their feet, you know, enjoying the things they like to do. Now that is fantastic. That's what we want to hear. Um, but that should also be part of Fool's interventions. So we're evidencing that through your, your action plans, your interventions, how you can promote better health outcomes to, to reduce that severity and improve quality of life. Um, so what we need is we need robust risk assessments to ensure that you've considered all factors and then, then we need the specific interventions as well. So what are we going to be doing to, to uh, support that individual? Because that's different for every single person you support. So if we go to step one and we look at the, the risk assessments, we know that the guidance recommends that we don't use the risk prediction tools. We don't want to say somebody is, oh, you know, low risk of falls or medium or high risk of falls, because what you might think is different to what I might think. So um, it's easier to to ensure that we we have all the risk factors and generally the more somebody has the higher that that risk goes what we do not want to offer is one size fits all blanket interventions so instead we want to ensure that everything is individualized and then that's from our assessments and our intervention plans as well um now some of you will have your set risk assessments from your uh, online care planning. Um, so you'll have that there. But what we've also designed to help you is a big multifactorial risk assessment, which just ensures you have considered all the risks. Now I'll share my screen shortly and you'll think, oh my God, it's huge. Um, it's not designed for you to spend hours filling out because you don't have that time. What it is designed for is for you to use, use it with what you've got and just think, have I considered all things? You know, have you considered the fear, the confidence, the anxiety? Now, that might be in other parts of your care plan, but is it in the full? So it's just almost, a, you know, just for you to use alongside with it. And you might just start with the people that may may be frequently falling Um to just start ensuring those risk assessments are, are robust enough. Um, so as we know, the assessment will be full of um, a person's risk factors for falling. And the more somebody has, the higher their, their risk will be. Um, without all the risks being documented, multifactorial interventions then get missed. And I find this such, I find this a lot. And if we take confidence and fear as one of them, because that came up, if you're not looking at somebody's fear, then how are we actually going to ensure we promote that person's co confidence or we put steps in place to have that person meeting some goals and achieving, even if it's a few more steps in a, in a day or whatever it might be. So we have to look at all the risks to ensure we can then put actions in place. The World Falls Guidelines, and a little sneak into to Thursday's webinar where we're gonna be diving into those a lot more, but it suggests that the individual's goals, values, beliefs, and priorities should also be documented, showing the values and preferences of the individuals. Um, and think, is that does that get shown within your Falls plans? And it definitely should be because it shouldn't be one size fits all, as we know. Um, I'll come to share my screen in a second um, because I've got a few things I want to show you. Um, and then the other thing is how do we triangulate across care plans? Um, and this comes into ensuring we've got all the risks in one place. So we know that a fool's care plan should contain all of the relevant documentation for each person. So the risks as we've spoken about and the interventions. But that sometimes will need to be cross-referenced with other parts of the care plan. So this may include your eating, your drinking, so your must scores, your hydration levels, um, how much activity um, somebody does, 
their engagement levels. So if that's tracked separately, we should bring that in, in as well. Their movement, how much are they moving in the day? Continents. Um, and should include things like, well, have we checked that against their weight? Have we checked that against their hydration levels? Let's check, you know, are they more withdrawn? How much time do they spend out of their room? Or how much time do they spend in the community? Or actually, is there loneliness there or isolation that comes into it? Or are, do they just sit in a chair all day? So we should be looking at all of those factors as well that might be in other parts of the care plan and, and bringing it across, which I know is a really difficult job. Um, so hopefully I've got some things to help you. So when we consider these other factors, you may also see a decrease in infections, GP calls, hopefully falls. Um, but overall, we're looking at that person holistically. So there will be other outcomes that will be promoted. So often when I'm looking at risk assessments and interventions, I see some things they've been forgotten and they're somewhere else but then they haven't been thought about with a fool's hat on. Um, and then they're not documented through assessments or interventions. So I'm gonna share my screen again. Um, and as I said, I'll make sure you get everything from today. Um, okay, so we're back here. Um, okay, so the first thing we have is a multifactorial risk assessment. And as I said, it's it's quite chunky. Um, it's not for you to fill out with every single person because that could be a crazy, uh, that would cost you a lot of time. But what we do want to do is just use it to ensure that you've considered all risks, as I've said. So it is um, split up into your intrinsic factors and then your extrinsic factors. As we know, your internal is about the person. So a few that we've got, I won't go through all of them, but we've got history of falls, um, recent history of falls um, in the last month, fear of falling, frailty. We look at cognitive function and mental health. Skip down a little bit further. Um, signs of uh, being um, unwell depression, anxiety, behaviours. And then what we've got here is some suggested risk reduction strategies. Now, we're not saying you have to do every single one of these. And um, we've got guidance along with this, which I will send you, but they're just suggestions. And we are always happy to talk through these suggestions. And um, if you're not aware of them or you want to um, talk about them in a little bit more detail. So... Um, for example, I see quite often, right, um, it's been noted that somebody has uh, been quite distressed in their behaviour, it has led to a fall, it might be quite common that they fall around a similar time, maybe it's around the four or five o'clock time in the evening. Um, so actually, my question is, okay, well, you've identified that, have we got the right education in place, um, with the right approaches to that person? Have we assessed that behaviour? Does that have we had training and pos positive behavior support and are there plans in place to ensure that we have looked at all of the factors that could cause that person to be distressed? We've been that investigator, you've got that magnifying glass out and that you've looked at all the reasons why that that could have happened. So not only have you identified that behavior is, is that risk, really, what are we doing about it? What do you have in, in place? Um, so there's lots here. And as I said, it's not for you to get your pen out and fill out for every individual, but maybe start with your frequent fallers or the people that you are maybe most concerned about. Look at your risk assessments and look if there's anything that you have missed. So it's there as an education as well, giving you some ideas, giving you some suggestions um, and then uh, to ensure that your, your assessments are where they need to be. If I then move on to triangulation, you may have seen this because we've sent this out the last few weeks. Is again pulling from other parts of the care plan. Um, so we've got um 
overall health of individuals. Um, and this will continue down about what we can do. Um, what uh, So we've got some you know, questions for you. Have you ensured you've got the right things in place? Um, but also, you know, if we think about patterns and trends, have we looked at all the things um, that we need to, such as staffing levels, evening falls? Um, what about activities? How engaged people are? Could it be loneliness or, or what's going on with that person? Physical activity and movement ensuring that we look at the everyday activity. So you might have in somebody's care plan what they can do, their day-to-day, -day, what their day-to-day -day looks like. Actually, let's pull that in also to falls and look at how much movement that promotes. Could we promote any more? Um, is there evidence of being risk positive to ensure that you know every single individual has the opportunity to improve? Um, are we practicing mobility and balance? So we look at the mobility part of the care plan. Has that been pulled through into falls to ensure that um, we are giving people the chance to mobilize, to do things for themselves? And we know sometimes that can take some more time, but that isn't so important as part of falls prevention. Um, are we monitoring? So are we monitoring how often somebody is moving? Why might they not be moving? Is it fear, confidence? Is it pain? Um, those things. So um, I remember an example somebody giving me in domiciliary care that they, um, instead of just using the, the lockbox and the key to go in, that they encourage that person to actually get up, answer the door because of that movement um instead of just letting that you know letting yourself in and, and it being quite easy from that way but actually encouraging that person to do a little bit more answer the door um and and support with also activities of daily living so there's lots here for you to use again it's just to help you ensure that you've included the right interventions that we've pulled things over from different care plans um even, you know, activity levels, engagement plans, those kind of things, ensuring that we have a focus on independence and daily living too as part of falls. Everybody can use this. So we'll, we'll make sure we get it sent out to you to, to have a look. Um, and hopefully that's just going to be a useful tool on ensuring that our, our interventions are really, you know, person centred. So what we want is um, falls interventions that are more than just sensor mats, call bells, equipment, checking footwear, clearing the environment. Yes, they are important, absolutely. Um, but we have to look bigger than that and look at a bigger picture and holistically at individuals. So instead, like I've spoken about already, how are we monitoring movement? How are we encouraging people out of bed if possible? Have we considered bone health, especially for severity of falls because of fractures? Um, and that is now in the World Falls Guidance. Um, is that, that should be something that's considered uh, for bone health. What are activities level, levels like for individuals, including for those uh, that live in with dementia? Mental health, setting goals for individuals to show how their goals, values, beliefs and priorities are being met. Again, very much outcome focused. Evidence of prevention of ill health. You know, I don't want you to just identify that somebody's fallen because they've had an infection and that they're on antibiotics and it's been cleared. Actually, what's the future of prevention like? So linking in very much with being proactive about how we're, we're preventing those infections. Can we improve movement? Is it hygiene levels? Um, how do we promote, you know, that increase of fluids? Structured exercise and everyday activity is promoting independence. We know that if we get people up on their feet, if possible, we're getting people more independent and we're getting people stronger than actually if they do fall, then actually outcomes are better. And um, so to practice mobility and balance and actually our staff doing with rather than just for because it's quicker. So it's all about that culture shift as well to try and improve that independence and confidence. So doing more, of course, doing more safely, 
Otherwise, we won't increase that confidence. We're not going to increase that ability. So we've got to break the cycle some somehow. So the evidence based, what, what it suggests is we know that even light activity brings health benefits compared to being sedentary. Um, so that's from gov.uk. The World Falls Guidance, as I said, going to dive into that more on Thursday, but performing um, nutritional optimization, including food rich in calcium and proteins, as well as vitamin D supplementation um, as part of an intervention for falls prevention, but also hugely for bone health and preventing those fractures we know can happen. Strong recommendation, um, older adults after sustaining a hip fracture should be offered individualized and progressive exercise programs um, aimed at improving mobility, such as standing up, balance exercises, walking, stair climbing as a falls prevention strategy. Now, nine times out of 10, I don't see this in falls intervention. So please, please have a look at this. Um, <clears throat> If somebody can't do structured exercise, let's look at how often they can stand up in the day. Let's look at how many activities of daily living they can do in the day. If they're, if they're being supported with personal care, can they stand up and do a little bit more standing rather than just sitting? Even if it's just shaving off a minute here or here and there. We know diabetes, high blood pressure, obesity, heart disease, stroke can, can affect blood vessels because of lack of um, activity. Um, even if risk of falls, there is a bigger risk in poor health um, of keeping people sedentary. Those outcomes are not going to get better. Of course, with the right risk assessments in place, risk management in place. Um, and as I said, we know that strength and balance is, is evidence to improve balance. And also we want to improve those activity levels. Because we know this is this is scary. Um, 10 days in bed is equivalent to a decade of muscle aging, which is scary. So we all age from about 30. We all age, make you feel good about ourselves. We all lose strength. We all lose power. But 10 days is equivalent to a decade. In the first 24 hours of being in bed, we reduce muscle power by two and a half percent. And in the first seven days, we reduce muscle strength by up to five to 10 percent. Let alone reduce skin integrity, reduce dignity, quality, confidence, independence and choice. And actually, the statistics of what people leave hospital uh, being able to do is really low with just 39 percent. Um, uh, with 39 percent of those with a new additional disability we're back to their usual level of function. And we know we want to improve people back to those baselines. So regular physical activities associated with up to 40% of risk reduction falls related injuries. So if I say to you, right, great, your severity, we want to focus on your severity of falls. What are you doing about it? We should be looking at that, those levels of movement, monitoring physical activity, because 66% risk reduction of bone fractures is huge. Um, so when we think about prevention, we've got to be proactive about delaying needs uh, from developing and ensuring people regain where possible. Um, so this was um, March this year, the NHS did, a, did an enablement falls webinar um, and they shared a trial that they did um, and I love it because everything that we're trying to do. So uh, we're getting there. So they did a trial with they had physical activity ambassadors um, and they were mentored through occupational therapists. Um, so what they did is they introduced physical activity sessions, which included exercise, dance, yoga, spontaneous activities. And they tailored it to individual re residents as well. So this was for residential they incorporated movement into every day. Um, so things like reaching to get a cup, reaching to get a doll to a resident with dementia instead of just giving it to them. Encouraging meaningful activity. So if somebody wants, you know, loves to clean and help around the house, how can we do that? 
um, and ensuring that personalised exercises were included in, in care plans. So what the outcomes were, it's all about improving those outcomes. And again, it's going to affect severity of injuries, improved sleep patterns, increased appetite and fluid intake, improved social connections, and also helped us a change in culture. So if we know people are sleeping better, then falls may not um, happen so much in the day and they could have more energy. They're eating better, drinking better, which means they're less risk of those infections. Um, their weights as well can improve, which we know is a falls risk factor. Improve social connection to helping with mental health um, and connecting to each other. And even though this was done, you know, in, in a residential um, home, Again, it, it goes across the board. It's what we all want to be promoting. And uh, in community settings, there was a study that was done on sit to stands. So how often somebody was standing in the day and they had a movement sensor. So it used to buzz every hour. If you've got Apple watches or Fitbits, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and it, it went off every hour um, and it um, ensured that individuals, they were doing about 15 more, 15 sit to stands a day. And what it resulted in is faster um, walking speed and more energy in the day. It didn't re it didn't increase falls, interestingly, um, but it ensured that those those people were, um, you know, having those better out outcome health outcomes. Um, you know, doing more in the day, having that more energy. So maybe they're not sleeping all day; they're moving more. Um, wanting to achieve more. So there's lots of good stuff there. Um, so the last bit I'm going to go through today, we're nearly there on time, um, is how we can promote this. So as I've spoken about, your risk assessments and your interventions, let's make sure they're person-centred. Let's make sure that we are looking at the outcomes of, of um, how we're improving those outcomes. So it's not just you know, make sure those sensor mats are on or those call bells are working or, um, you know, the, the their footwear are fine. Let's really look at that overall health because that is going to affect severity. Um, and we can start to also evidence this in our framework. Now, this is appropriate for every single person, you know, in whatever care setting you're part of. We want you to evidence the great stuff that you are doing. Um, and also possibly find any gaps that maybe you're missing as well. Um, we are always, I'm always happy to sit down with you and go through this um, as well, because we want um, anyone to start to achieve an exceeded, assured or partially met or not met status. I'll go through that, what that means. It has been signed off by Hertfordshire County Council, because we, again, with the focus on outcomes, with the focus on prevention and how we're keeping people well and reducing hospital admissions you can show what you're doing so we've got 10 topics and, and we score each topic which then results to an overall scoring of either exceeded assured partially met or not met and we we want you to get to that 80 percent and over at assured levels um and we've based that on how um the cqc ratings as well but ultimately, you know, you're not going to get to that assured or that exceeded level if, if we've got things that are not met. And our topics look at, you know, prevention and enablement overall. So we've got culture, ensuring that we've got that enabling culture within the service. Um, governance and auditing. So how are we um, how are we evidencing that prevention? Um, you know, looking at those robust risk assessments those interventions being risk positive because we know sometimes people might be safer sat down and we say sit down sit down sit down but actually you know quite often the risk or that poses more of a risk when people do start to move goal setting and outcomes so how we are ensuring that we are getting people meeting the things that they want to do their goals their wishes um and how we're promoting better health outcomes for them so monitoring trends so looking at your trends and themes of falls but also maybe ill health um 
which we're making sure we're, we're documenting right how many chest infections utis etc are happening knowledge and competence so ensuring we've got number one falls knowledge there um but also you know we're looking at if there are any trends and patterns that we were getting the right skills um into the service my favorite few are coming up so we've got movement and exercise engagement plans so ensuring that we're looking at um, mental health as well as physical, uh, prevention of admission, um, ensuring, again, part of how are we using prevention of admission services and how are we promoting better health outcomes. So we don't need to call 999 if it's not appropriate. Environment and equipment um, is, that, is the last one, is, is number 10. So we've just gone, got to 10 to 10 to 12 and some key takeaways, hopefully you can take from today. I know it's been pretty quick, um, is management of when somebody has fallen is essential and how we can prevent further falls and how we have managed that fall when we're, we're aware of that we've evidenced all the right information, including the severity. So understanding that uh, what the severity of that fall has been after everyone and, and documenting it we know many people will fall so um due to their long-term health conditions um due to um you know many other those risk factors so we want to evidence as part of their falls how we're promoting those positive out health outcomes because that will help reduce that severity keeping people as well as possible looking at that bigger picture to support people's health outcomes. Um, so we're not just using standard falls prevention strategies. We're looking at goals. We're looking at what they want to achieve. We're looking at how we can monitor that movement, look at activities of daily living, um, ensuring that we're, we're looking at um, social side of things, isolation, uh, we, um, being withdrawn, et cetera. And ensuring that you have the right skill sets. So you will know everything we do as, as part of HCPA, but we've got education for you to, to start this. So we've got exercise instructor courses for you, level two chair based. It's a start to just get people moving a bit more. We've got enabling champion that you can come on to fully funded that is taken by my um, brilliant clinical lead, who's a physiotherapist. So giving you practical skills, falls champions. I can spend hours talking about falls. You all know that. So uh, four days of falls and frailty. Um, dementia education there. Um, ensuring that we're also uh, up to date with falls education. And we are putting some new fall, falls courses on. Falls and enabling a, a day course um, to ensure that we're, you know, giving you just as much information in, in one go as possible if as we know champions are not for every single member of staff so there's lots there lots of resources that you will get um and you can always drop us a line if you need anything or have any questions to ensure that you know what we are doing is we've got robust assessments in place we're focusing on prevention because ultimately we want if those falls are, are going to happen, we want that severity to be, to be low. Um, we want to promote people's health outcomes. So last five or so minutes, please make sure you go into the chat, any questions you've got for me um, or anything that, or tell me anything that you, you're gonna take away from today. That's always lovely to know. Um, on Thursday, I'm diving into the guidance, the, the World Falls guidelines even more, looking at specific risks with specific interventions, um, because we've very much spoken about the governance and the auditing side of things today. Um, so uh, please join us if you haven't signed up. It will be recorded, so if you can't make it, don't worry. Um, but again, all about being, being proactive and, and looking at those specific interventions. Um, so that's us done. As I said, please use the chat. I'm going to give you a few uh, few minutes. Um, yes, you do need to sign up again. So there is another sign up link and I'll send it in a follow up email. So you'll get 
you'll get it from me either this afternoon or tomorrow. No problem. So yeah, let me know if you've got anything uh, you want to ask for the last few minutes or anything you want to take away. Um, I'm going to put my email in the chat if you don't have it already. Um, I don't, we don't share the sessions on LinkedIn. Um, no, but we will add a recording up. It'll be on our website. We'll make sure you get the recording as well if you do want to um, watch it again. Yes, you'll get all the slides from today. So feel free to drop out if you haven't got um, anything to ask me. Um, you're welcome. Nightmare with Zoom, normal technology, struggles, no problem. So we've got all your email addresses um, and we'll get you a follow-up email anyway after today. Um, but hopefully see you not on Thursday at an, another point. I'll just stay on till 11. So feel free to uh, log off if you're ready to go. Um, some of your staff couldn't log on today. As it said, you're already logged in. Um, I, as I said, it'll be, this is recorded, so I'll send it back out to you so you'll be able to watch it. Do I have posters encouraging residents to ask for assistance when they need it? No, we don't. Um, I've heard of some good good uh, kind of getting creative with non-verbal and verbal prompts with things like even little rhymes, like call the bell so you don't, I don't know, fall or something like that. Um, but again, with falls interventions, with ensuring people are using call bells and things like that, many people, it's not enough, is it? So actually, how could we improve that person potentially, if, if possible, to be a little bit safer to mobilize themselves to go to the toilet or, or get assistance because we know not everybody wants that um, and they'll don't want to be a burden and they'll <laughs> they'll try everything they can to do it themselves so actually could you focus on strength mobility balance ensuring you've got the right lighting in the room the right equipment those kind of things setting small goals for people to achieve Yeah, pride is a big one. So when people just don't want to ask for help. Um, so, I mean, there's only so much that we can do except maybe increase checks unless you provide one-to-one. -one. You know, sometimes that is the only way to prevent those falls unless somebody has a one-to-one. -one. Um, but yeah, it's looking at ways we could improve or if that's his goal to do things by himself, could we involve him with that? Could we include some steps to get him stronger? Um, it, it depends. It depends with so, so much, you know, what he's living with or, you know, his, his falls risk factors. You're welcome. So I'm just going to stick around for the last minute. Feel free to drop off. Um, okay, you, yes, we'll get you, we'll definitely get you certificates out um, after Thursday. So yes, no problem.
Okay, everyone, thank you so much. Um, I'll just hang around for the last few minutes if there's any other questions, as I said, or feel free to drop off. Okay, thank you so much. I'm going to end the session.